Hello and good morning everyone or good afternoon, good evening depending on your location and welcome to the fourth session of the DigiPrint University uh, 2017 or season two. Um, to sum things up, what we have done so far in this season is, um, you know, we, we, we um, got us a Mimaki GV3 250SP uh, printer in a very bad state and the idea is to um, bring this printer back to life. Now, um, in previous sessions we did assessment of the printer with tests and checks and visual inspe inspections to see the state of the printer, or to know the state of the printer and to know what it would take to make this printer work again. <clears throat> Then in the second session, we worked on uh, anything that has to do with uh, motion, with the media feeding inside the printer and with um, the carriage traveling from left to right and right to left. So these parts that we checked um, during that session, like scan motor, feed motor and linear encoder, um, belts and gears, <clears throat> They all checked out fine, except for some settings in the scan motor and uh, the belt on the scan motor that caused an error uh, on our printer. So that was resolved. And then in the previous session, session three, we worked on, um, on anything that has to do with ink delivery. So we checked the ink lines, we checked um, the connection to the ink cartridges, capping station, pumps, uh, stuff like that. We found a bunch of errors there as well. Um, well, not as much errors like they would appear on the screen, but more um, um, visual uh, inspection that returns uh, parts that needed to be replaced, like uh, some of the cap tops, for instance. And today we are talking about uh, print heads. And um, as you as you know, the print head is by far the most important part in our printers. If we look at um, what we are doing and, and, and uh, our complete range of products, which is uh, thousands of products for your printers, then uh, definitely the number one uh, spare part is a print head. Okay? So despite the fact that it doesn't have any um, moving parts like a scan motor or a feed motor that is very prone to uh, wear and tear and, and, and that needs to be replaced because you know it's going to be worn out one day. The print head does, doesn't have any of these parts yet it is the most replaced part in a printer and there's various reasons for that. So <clears throat> I'm going to close our survey here. Thank you for your answers and I'm going to open a presentation. So let's end voting. Okay, and go to the presentation. Let's pick the correct one. Should be in English. Um, as a reminder, this session is repeated again uh, tonight at six uh, for our North American customers, but it is also repeated next week, Tuesday at 11 in the morning for um, Italian customers in Italy and in the evening in Spanish. Okay, today we're doing it in English. So, a little presentation with some background information uh, on print heads and uh, how they work. And after that presentation, we'll go to the video. And in that video, we'll show you a couple of things. First, we are going to uh, try to, to save our print heads from our Mimaki GV3, which, by the way, are Epson DX4 print heads, hence the question and survey. And we're going to use um, an ultrasonic device for that. And after that, we're going to put the print heads back in, into the printer. So it's kind of like a print head replacement procedure, but in reverse order, where you um, get the part that we reinstall the print head. Okay. So print head maintenance and installation. Let's see. So why maintenance? Um, might seem a bit of a... Um, of a dumb question at first, but um, it's very important to understand why good maintenance is important. There's maintenance and good maintenance, of course. And the three main reasons for maintenance on your printhead is to extend the life of your printhead. 
A printhead has a number, number of actuations that the piezo elements can perform. That's the lifespan of a printer and it's x million actuations that they can do. But <clears throat> the better you take care of your print head, the longer your print head will perform um, in a good man manner. Um, if that print head is performing in a good manner, the quality of your printouts will be maintained as well. So that's reason number two. And of course, uh, very clearly, if you don't have to replace a print head because you took good care of it, you're reducing the over cost. Right, <clears throat> there's two types of maintenance um, in my world, and that's proactive maintenance or preventive maintenance and reactive maintenance. And proactive maintenance is taking good care of your printer by using maintenance cycles, by using a daily, a weekly, and a monthly maintenance cycle. And reactive maintenance, uh, as you can guess, is maintenance that you do because you ran into trouble. Okay? So, we're all for proactive maintenance and these two schedules here, like a daily maintenance task and weekly maintenance task, is um, a guidance. But if you look into the user manual of your particular printer, you will find maintenance cycles explained there as well. And it really depends on the printer. But in general, this is what needed to be done uh, on, on, on a daily basis, and that's cleaning around the print heads capping the wiper, the paper guides, and the media sensor all cleaned, and that'll take you maybe five minutes. Your weekly maintenance, you will clean the pattern, you'll clean the encoder strip, strip sorry, empty the waste bubble if you haven't done it um, during that week because waste bubbles usually get um, emptied when there is an, uh, a message on, on the LCD, and you clean the exterior. So these maintenance tasks don't take uh, a lot of time. I want to focus on cleaning around the print heads in the daily maintenance tasks because um, as we already discussed during the previous session where we talked about ink delivery and capping station, we also briefly discussed the function of the wiper. And the wiper is the only part, it's a piece of felt or rubber, depending on your printer, it's the only part inside your printer that um, touches the nozzle face of your print head, okay? And in all other cases, you are not supposed to be touching the nozzle face of, of, of your print head, in theory. Um, and of course, if we're talking about the more industrial print heads, like uh, the Psycho and Dynamics print heads, um, it's common practice to clean those print heads with clean room uh, wipes, for instance, and, and, and a cleaning liquid solution. But uh, in this particular case, where we talk about Epson print heads, print heads, DX4, DX5, DX6, and DX7, uh, it's not a good idea to touch the print heads with a clean room wipe, okay? They are way too fragile uh, to be cleaned that way. But cleaning around the print heads will make sure that there's not a layer of dry ink ink that um, starts to build up around the print head because um, if you have this, uh, this, this layer of dried up ink, sooner or later it's going to um, come loose and it might end up between the media and uh, your print head, uh, effectively damaging the nozzles. So <clears throat> cleaning around the print head um, on a daily basis is um, a good way of doing proactive maintenance. So printhead parts, um, we have a DX5 example here and um, you can see the nozzle face. DX5 has eight channels um, or eight rows of nozzles and um, DX4 has only two, DX6 has eight and DX7 has ten to make the picture complete. Most industrial print heads, I have an example of that too, have only one row. Although we now see um, other print head manufacturers, especially Rico, starting to build uh, print heads with more than one row uh, of nozzles or even more than one channel. Um, there's a protection plate uh, which raises um, a little bit above the nozzle face so that it can, it's, it's sort of a guard to uh, avoid uh, media running into the nozzle faces 
when you have a head strike. There's a manifold. Uh, manifold guides the ink into the print head, so it, it has connectors for the dampers, ink nipples, um, and it just guides it towards uh, the actual print head. And of course, there's a data connector. So there's 180 nozzles per row, and the nozzle size is 5 micron. So as I said, very small, um, very fragile as well. The piezo elements used in an Epson DX whatever print head is not of the same um, sturdy quality as in our industrial print heads. So you can see here the manifold from a different size, and there uh, on the right, the picture on the right, I opened up the DX5. Um, the manifold is in the back, and you can see a rubber gasket with uh, eight connections there. Um, that's where the ink enters the print head. Um, if you look at the general build quality and how the head is engineered, um, the only reason why Epson heads were so popular is because you could have a full CMYK um, uh, printer with only one print head, or in the case of the DX4, two print heads. Where uh, with other print heads, back in the days when the Epson DX4 and DX5 were launched, you needed at least four uh, to get CMYK. So they were cheap and cheerful, and that's how they are built. Uh, that gasket is the only protection of ink or any other liquid, cleaning liquid, for instance, touching the electronics. Okay, and it's not. Um, it's not precision engineered to uh, fit on the manifold. So sooner or later, that gasket um, is starting to cause problems. Right, so this is an industrial print head. This is a Cyclone uh, SPT 510. Um, it only has one nozzle face, one nozzle line, uh, and the size of the nozzle is not 5 micron, but 35 micron in this case. It has a built-in damper and it has a built-in heater for uh, Butech printers. It doesn't come with a heater standard. And of course, it has uh, electronics just like the Epson DX head. So a completely different type of print head uh, than our Epson print head. Uh, reflected in the price, but also reflected in uh, the build quality. So what cleaning tools do we use? Um, of course, latex gloves, swabs, and clean room lint free wipes, very important. And um, we can also use a cleaning kit, which basically is a syringe connected to a damper that can be connected directly to an Epson printer to push cleaning liquid through the print head or an ultrasonic cleaning device. Now, um, a word of warning on both of these um, tools. Um, the cleaning kit, if you connect it to a print head, an Epson print head that has dried ink inside, um, you will feel a lot of resistance when you try to push the syringe. Okay? If there is too much resistance, don't force it. Forcing it is me means always uh, or always means breaking the DDP element. So only if it um, if it is relatively easy to push the cleaning liquid through, you should continue with that cleaning kit. And the same word of advice goes for the ultrasonic, any ultrasonic device. Epson printers are not, uh, Epson print heads, sorry, are not built to be used with an ultrasonic device. That doesn't mean that you can't uh, use an ultrasonic device on Epson print heads, but you need to do it with great caution. And we'll see that uh, in the video. Right, okay. Yes, we don't use alcohol. The only um, part where you can use isopropanol alcohol is on the linear encoder, but we don't use alcohol on anything else, especially not on uh, cap tops or wipers or stuff like that. Um, cleaning liquids, like the ones that you use to um, clean your windows, um, also not a very good idea, although on some Epson print heads, uh, soaking the print heads overnight on a lint-free um, clean room wipe soaked in uh, Windex or other window cleaning uh, solutions might uh, open up a print head again. There's uh, plenty of videos on YouTube 
uh, of people doing it on an Epson printer, and these Epson printers use uh, the same Epson print heads that our Mimaki, Roland, and Mutual use. And of course, you shouldn't be mixing ink and cleaning liquid brands. Um, that's general advice, that's manufacturer's advice. Um, but in, in real life, um, all these cleaning liquids, um, and I, I already mentioned that before, uh, I examined a lot of these cleaning liquids um, in, in a lab and based upon the documentation that was available, and basically they are all more or less the same. Um, if you have uh, an equal solvent Roland printer, and you have a printer with SS21 inks in Mimaki, which is like a mild solvent, then the cleaning liquid is quite compatible. Of course, you can't use a cleaning liquid that is intended for a printer with hot solvent ink and you set on an equal solvent. Okay. Print replacement, a couple of tools that we need. Uh, no surprises here, although maybe the torque wrench, but we don't need it for our printer for our Mimaki. But if you have um, a Roland uh, printer, any Roland printer, then you need or you're advised to use a torque wrench when you put the screws back that uh, secures the print head into the carriage. Um, yes, power down, disconnect the power cord from the power outlet and then press the power button a few times to discharge the printer. You can see that in any video, any replacement video that we have put on our YouTube channel, all our videos start with this procedure. So a good practice. Um, and a word on data cables. Um, when you replace a print head, when you order a new print head and you're replacing the print head, um, try to remember to order a set of data cables along with it. Um, data cables are very notorious for um, causing troubles, all sorts of troubles, up to short circuiting uh, the electronics in your print head because some of the pens, pins were banned or any other reason. So it's a good idea to have a fresh set of data cables with you. And if you replace the print head, replace the data cables as well. Good. And then the head rank, um, you'll see in the video that we have, uh, we, we were forced to use um, a kind of um, um, an orthodox way of uh, keeping track of the, of the head rank. But every printer comes with a head rank, which is uh, a series of characters that describes the characteristics, the specific characteristics, characteristics of this print head. And it's like a calibration. It, it, it tells um, the printer what voltage is needed for this specific print head in order to uh, have the correct opening and closing of the piezo elements. Um, when you look at um, cycle print heads or uh, Toshiba print heads, then um, you usually will have a voltage there or a voltage and a waveform. If it's a, a grayscale head, then you'll have a waveform as well. Right, our Mimaki, that's more or less how the carriage uses the essence of it. Um, yep, it has dampers and a damper holder sitting over the print head. The print head is mounted on something that is called the AD plate, and the AD plate allows it to be positioned correctly in the head unit base or the carriage. And the AD plate also has the set of grooves and rims that are necessary for the adjuster spring and the angle spring. And these two springs, uh, together with the adjustment screw, are uh, necessary for the um, alignment. Okay, so let's have a look at what we did. So uh, the video I'm going to show you, we start with some um, clean sonic, uh, ultrasonic on our Epson DX4 print head. We also do it on a cycle print head just to show that uh, you can use any type of print head in a clean sonic device. And then we'll go to the Mamaki GV3 where we uh, reinstall uh, a DX4 print head in, in that printer. So just a second. So let's first start with uh, testing a DX4 in our ultrasonic. So I'm going to set a cycle of one minute of ultrasonic waves. And uh, when I start the cycle, 
the ultrasonic cleaning device brings the head and the bracket down and I added cleaning liquid so that the surface of the print head is touching the surface of the cleaning liquid but not more than that. So now it's going to use both flushing because the pump is uh, pushing cleaning liquid through uh, the print head and at the same time ultrasonic waves are used to um, create ultrasonic vibration uh, to the nozzle surface. So we're going to have a look on how that looks. And these type of uh, clean sonic ultrasonic cleaner pro device comes with a full set of brackets and tube assemblies so that you can virtually uh, install any um, head in there to have it cleaned. Now I verified whether the surface of the print head was touching uh, the surface of the cleaning liquid which was not the case so I added a little bit of um, cleaning liquid and so we're going to start that cycle again. And I'm just going to hold the, the print head because while there are brackets that really firmly and securely hold print heads like um, any Dymatics and SAR print head and Psycho print head, for the Epson print heads it's uh, a little bit tricky. And you don't really have to hold it, but I'm just trying to be 100% sure that I will get um, a good uh, cleaning cycle and a good uh, cleaning result. So we're going to let that cycle run for about one minute. And I would advise on Epson print heads not to use cycles any longer if you put an industrial grade print head in there, like a cycle or a Spectra or a Nova Galaxy. In there then you can leave it running overnight in cycles of five minutes ultrasonic five minutes flushing but I would not advise you to do that with Epson print heads these print heads are quite fragile and using an ultrasonic device on them without caution will result in a damaged print head instead of a recovered print head okay so bring it up again And let's see if we have some result. Let the pump cycle through. And you can see in the cleaning liquid that there are ripples. So this head is uh, open. Now to show you that this type of ultrasonic cleaning device can be used on a wide variety of print heads, I'm also showing you how to use it on a cycle print head. So there's a different um, tube assembly that is used. There's also a different bracket. And this is a, um, a GS508 print head. It's a type of print head that is used in uh, Vutic printers, among others, or in Hollander's color booster. And you can see here very clearly in the cleaning liquid container that this print head, if you would see it up close, let's see if we can get any closer to that and go down a little bit. So you would see that you have a nice curtain, a mist of cleaning liquid from nozzle one to the last nozzle, meaning that um, this, this print head is fully operational. Um, what it nozzles um, are about. So positioning it more so that you can see it clearly. It's a nice curtain of cleaning liquid spraying down into the container. So this head is approved. Like I said, you can use it for a very wide variety of uh, print heads. And what we did with the Mimaki GV3 is we took all four DX4 heads and clean them in the ultrasonic. And we did not recover all four of them. We recovered three, three of them, but one is uh, really gone. And that is the magenta head. And that's not a really um, a surprise. So back to our Mackie GV3. Now we've taken out all the print heads. And what we need to do now is uh, reinstall 
the entire carriage. So we need to rebuild the entire carriage of that print head. And first goes in um, the, the, the head base and that is secured with two screws onto the beam. So we're going to put in those two screws. You can see the four positions, the four holes intended for the four TX4 print heads. And then we're going to add the bigger screws that are actually used. These, these um, are added and removed as we see fit because um, you don't need them all the time, but we will install them to have um, uh, stability in our carriage before we install any print heads. But we're going to have to remove them when we start installing uh, other parts of the carriage, like a damper holder, for instance. Okay, let's make sure that the cables are out of the way. And as you can see, we need to take them out a little bit because now uh, the entire carriage is resting onto our capping station. So also the position of these two um, uh, big screws determines the height of the print head. Uh, just remember that the Mimaki GV3 is a very old printer and is not the most advanced printer in the world uh, today. So let's move it over the platen and make sure that we get our damper soup with it. We'll slide it over. We put some media onto the platen to make 100% sure that we do not drip any ink or other liquids onto the platen and to uh, keep it clean. Let's reposition the camera a little bit. So there is our carriage. It does already have the tool carriage. You can see it to the left. We never took out the, the tool carriage, but we did take out the entire carriage. And the reason for that was that it allowed us to try and clean it the best we could. Okay. And you can see we wrapped a paper towel around our dampers but no ink comes out of the dampers anymore because all the ink lines were flushed from cartridge to damper. You could see that in the previous session that we did, um, we, we flushed one ink line and then after that, uh, once the session was done, um, we just flushed all ink lines um, on this printer. So there will be no ink uh, dropping out of the damper, damper. Maybe a little bit of ink cleaning the liquid uh, solution or mixture but uh, the, 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 the pure ink has been flushed from the machine. Right, now as you could see from the drawing during the presentation there's a couple of um, uh, springs in there, there's one for the angle, uh, the angle spring which will take, that takes care of um, of the slant and then there's the adjustment spring that takes care of the back and forth so these are all parts that we need to reinstall in our print head carriage okay now the first thing that we need to do is put the AD plate back onto the DX4 print head you could see the AD plate in in the drawing as well during the presentation so here it is it's a uh, a metal piece um, that allows the DX4 print head to fit exactly into uh, the carriage and it has the necessary rims and grooves where the springs, the angle spring and the adjustment spring uh, can grip so that the entire print head uh, assembly, if you would like to call it that, when the AD plate is installed, the entire assembly can be aligned. So there's uh, two screws that put together the AD plate and the DX4 print head. So these need to go back. And we need a fairly small Phillips screwdriver to do that. Right, let's get everything into place. It only fits one way. If you fit it wrong, the screw holes will not align and you can't uh, enter the, the, the screws, of course. So this is how it needs to be fitted.
and as you can see and and this is uh, fairly sound advice but uh, maybe you can see it on the video maybe you cannot but the label with the head ID has suffered severely from the cleaning liquids and the ultrasonic cycles that we used on it so before you start working on any print head um, with ultrasonic or in any other way with a cleaning kit make a picture of um, the head ID right and make a mark on that print head so we used a, a red marker on the opposite side uh, once cleaning was done and um, we put one two three or four uh, vertical lines and then the pictures we just took pictures printed them and put the vertical lines there as well otherwise there's no way of keeping track of um, the head rank which head rank goes with which print head and um, as you can see these these printed labels with the head rank they are not cleaning liquid uh, resistant so <clears throat> take your precautions on that so the AD plate is back on the DX4 print head. We need to secure it a little bit more. We just had a little issue with that other screwdriver. The angle was not right. <clears throat> okay. So these are the others. The other ID plates for the other heads, but we're going to install one DX4 from uh, start to finish, and um, of course, all the other three um, DX4 print heads need to be installed in the same way. So, <clears throat> when you install it, it's important that um, the right side and um, the back. So in this case, the right side and the back, well in any case, these need to be aligned properly. You need to push it to the back and to the right before you secure the print head. Because that's, that's the basic position of the print head. And you secure it um, with the supplied screws, with the original screws, and you tighten it completely. And you do that for all the four print heads. And then when you go back into the alignment uh, that needs to be done, you will loosen the screws that hold the print head slightly so that turning the adjustment screw has effect. If you don't loosen those three screws, then you can turn the adjustment screw all you want. Nothing will happen. So that print head is in place. It needs to be secured now. There's three screws that are used to uh, secure this type of print head into the carriage of the Mimaki GB3 250 SP. A little monster which we try to revive so again three Phillips screws if you look at the uh, mechanical drawing for a Mimaki GV3 uh, you will notice that um, of course it has hundreds and hundreds of screws <coughs> but there's little variation in those screws Right, <clears throat> so making sure that nothing is in the way. And we also verify it once again whether the AD plate is installed correctly on the DX4 print head. Better do it now than after the print head has been secured and you built the entire carriage again. Right, so remember, push it to the back and to the right. And basically that's for, for any print head, any Epson print head that you install will always be um, aligned to the back and to the right at least for basic alignment or basic installation before you do the actual actual uh, alignment okay where are the screws 
Now I did mention that most of the screws in the Meraki GV3 are Phillips screws, but the head is secured with hex screws, three of them. So you went to them precisely. And you secure them all the way. Right, one in the back. If you remember the drawing, then you could see that these screws, um, there's one in the back, one in this on the side, and one in the front. They're not so easy to get to. We also did replace um, our data cables, at least for the head we are installing now. It's a hard fit this one, doesn't seem to um, Now it's in, now we need to tighten it. Okay, so it's nearly in. And then we have to um, install springs, stuff like that. Connect cables and install dampers. So as you can see, um, installing uh, a print head back into the printer and of course taking the print head out is just the opposite it's the reversed procedure but um, if, if you take your time and you have the necessary documentation like uh, mechanical drawings or a user guide uh, which are all um, <coughs> good documents to have at hand when you're doing something like this um, then it's a fairly easy process Right, spring goes in. Just going to lock it onto a flat screwdriver, connect it to the print head and then to the carriage. adjustment screw need to go back as well there it goes and this one grips into um, one of the springs and this is the angle spring so that needs to go back as well it's going to take care of uh, slant alignment or adjustment during the uh, alignment procedure Make sure that these springs are neatly installed and are in the correct position so that um, <coughs> you don't get into trouble with your alignment but also they, they have their function. Uh, in all honesty once the print head has been aligned and the three screws holding it to the carriage have been tightened they don't do anything anymore but during the alignment they're very crucial. They make sure that whatever you dial in stays dialed in. Right, let's completely secure the print head. And then install the data cables and um, you will see that there is only one correct way to install the data cables. And if you install them in the wrong order, so the pins not facing correctly, not inserting the connector correctly, then um, short circuit will happen. So they need, they need to be um, installed in the correct way. 
and also uh, in the correct order if you swap them like this by accident then the result is again short circuit and you should always um, check the, the, the pins on the flat cable whether they are not bent uh, or they are not um, um, pushed to one side so <coughs> quality of your data cable is very important and um, very often underestimated but a bad data cable can cause a lot of uh, misery in your printer right as you can see we labeled them and we need to um, guide these through the damper holder So the damper holder is on there. And the cables are finally in the correct position. So insert them firmly straight, leveled like that and you can see that the DX4 print head has some movement so it's not completely uh, tightened yet the screws but also the electronics um, have a little bit of um, of flexibility it's not necessary it's just how the DX4 print head is designed Right, once these are installed, the damper holder can come down and the two dampers for this specific print head can be installed. So the damper holder is on the print head and now we can install the two dampers. And we're going to do um, exactly the same for the other three print heads. And then uh, once this is done, of course, we will build the rest of the carriage but that's just uh, screwing in metal plates like uh, the, um, not the damper holder, but the, um, well, it actually it's a damper holder as well, but not on the head. It sits on the dampers and keeps them in position and then the carriage cover. Um, so we're going to install these as well and then we'll be um, up to the next session um, where we will have uh, several tests uh, of these print heads and look at nozzle out scenarios. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm back. I'm gonna open the chat for your questions. To be open. So as you can see, uh, we still have some things to do on our Mimac GB3 uh, printer to have it completely up and running. But we are getting there. Um, we have three working heads. We're going to replace the back head, of course. We replaced all data cables. Uh, we did replace all dampers uh, as well um, yesterday. So. Um, all that is left for us to do is see how the print heads behave. So load up some ink and see how that is going. Let's see if I can put that all back up. Oh. Once you ended voted, voting, voting is ended. Good. Yes, um, it is. Uh, if you go to our website, let me see if I can get that on screen. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So create summit. That's what I want. <coughs> Where is Rico? <coughs> Just a second. Yeah. So Sorry, just needed the zip. So yes, um, Rigo Hitachi Gen 3 um, has um, ink nipples. And you can just connect uh, a tubing assembly, a supplied tubing assembly, and um, use the Clean Sonic to clean uh, the Rigo Hitachi Gen 3, uh, both the um, E1 and E3. And um, it's a sturdy built head, so you can use overnight cleaning cycles on a Gen 3 head. Yeah, sorry, uh, 1001 and 1003. Hmm. We use it with a lot of SAR heads, but 1001 and 1003 are fairly new heads, and they use a different principle than a traditional uh, print head. They actually intended for the ceramic uh, market. Uh, in which printer do you, in which printer do you have these heads, uh, Javier? <clears throat> um, I need to look into that whether the thousand and one and thousand and three will perform well um, on, on on our ultrasonic, oh, a Durst uh, ceramic printer, I suppose then. <coughs> that depends, Klimo. If you have a printer that has fuses uh, protecting the print heads, then the fuses will be blown and you'll need to replace the fuses. And depending on your printer, these fuses will be on the carriage board or slider board or on the main board. And nowadays, most of these fuges, fuses <laughs> are uh, cartridges which you can just pop out and replace, but on older boards, these fuses were actually soldered in, so you need to be a, a little bit handy to take the old fuses out and solder new ones in. If you haven't got any protection with um, fuses for your print heads, then um, you can blow the electronics on your print head, you can blow um, the piezo element itself because there's uh, way too much current going onto those elements. And um, these elements open and because a, a, a voltage is applied and closed when the voltage is gone. But if you apply a voltage that is way too strong, they just, they, they burst. Um, and you could also fry your motherboard. Which dust machine is it then, have you? A dust machine with 1001 print head. One of the newer ones. So, take care of inserting your flat cables. It's always a good um, practice when you do something like this. Um, when you place a print header in your other part in your printer, um, to take pictures along the way. So that you don't have to uh, start guessing like, hey, how were the cables inserted or how was this installed? You just take pictures of what you're taking out. Everybody has a smartphone anyway nowadays, and that has an excellent camera. Yeah, or uh, regarding your question, Irina, or when the ink nipple on the print head is blocked, then you would get um, a reflow as well. Um, the RG900 has a DX5 print head and has the small dampers, um, so these are, are, are sealed. Um, let me think if you can force open the seal on the damper, 
for these type of print heads to see if ink is, is flowing out. Um, I need to I need to look into that. Let's see. Um, Muto draft station. See how it looks. Uh, where is the head? There it is. Oh, look at that. They forgot to put the dampers in the drone. <laughs> right here it is. So it's a EF42110. Um, I'm not sure about an air leak, uh, Clément. Because an air leak, um, that because I don't see any any behavior like that like the ink flowing back to the ink cartridges because of an air leak if you have an air leak at least some ink should come through and result into uh, missing nozzles and bad prints uh, RG 900 this one Uh, oh. yeah. Did you only replace one damper, uh, Irina? Are these, um, did you replace all of the dampers on the Muto RG900 or only one? Uh, Nick, um, um, is it always the same nozzles that are out? Or if you uh, do cleaning in between, other nozzles are out? You definitely need to watch the next session that we do in two weeks, because that's on nozzle out scenarios. Just one. When you don't have a spare damper to see whether the problem is with the damper or the problem is somewhere else. Ah. There is the old damper back. See what happens. <coughs> Okay, I see. Did you replace the data cables, Nick? If your data cable has some sort of uh, problem, and um, not all of the information sent from the printer arrives at the electronics of the print head, then you could have uh, this type of behavior as well. Yeah, it should, Nick. Or if you don't have an extra set of data cables, just switch it with the data cables of a head that is, uh, oh, hang on, that depends what printer you have. Did you say, Mimaki GV, you only have one head. So yeah, order a set of data cables and replace them. That are the tricky ones. Remote. That are the tricky ones. If you do a cleaning and you have a, a good um, novel test, and then you start printing and your cyan is gone. If you if cyan is gone, 
uh, Ramon, and you don't do a cleaning, how does your nozzle test look? Still okay? Right on side note, um, as you know, on our YouTube channel, um, you can watch this session again. You can watch all previous sessions again of uh, the DigiPrint University. <clears throat> Just head over to YouTube, youtube.com and in the search window, type in DigiPrint Supplies and you'll end up on our video channel. <clears throat> so you do a cleaning. Your cyan is good. You start printing, cyan is gone. You do a test without cleaning, cyan looks bad. Capping. Capping causing uh, an air leak might um, cause this behavior. So <clears throat> it might be that um, the seal on, on, on uh, the cyan head, although you do a cleaning, and it looks good on the novel test, you start printing and it loses sign during printing. Printing that hasn't got anything to do with capping. This is a tricky one, Raymond. I would advise you to uh, open a ticket with our support guys. They will be more than happy to help you with this one. But it's going a, bit, a, bit, a little bit uh, beyond the scope of what I can do here uh, in this chat window. Okay, guys, <clears throat> thank you very much for joining us today. Hope to see you again in two weeks when we have the last session and we will talk about nozzle uh, out scenarios. So make sure you join uh, Dan. We'll look at several solutions. We'll look at uh, usual suspects, but also the suspects that you usually forget. And um, have a nice rest of the day. Cheers.